make decisions if they really are not independent. But as I said, independence means not isolation. So that also that professionalism on uh, such and foresight is not This is the, the third corner, rights and obligations. Of course, fundamental rights, freedoms, economic, social, cultural rights, but also more or less also human rights, which are somehow the minimum substance for fundamental rights. We have seen it in our country so that there will be quite often balancing interests between different fundamental rights. For example, here, freedom of expression against privacy, right of possession, environmental rights, and what is very often in foreground, right of assembly, right to organize meetings against public security. These are, of course, questions to be solved in all the countries, but that is highly important that the substance, the real substance of civil and human rights with security. This is the fourth corner functionality. Publish your documents, participation, right of the field. I have to say only some two things about that. In our country, freedom to information was uh, stated already 1766. That was the first act in the world and uh, compared with US, which will like be a model of free world, the first act of information was stated 1966, <coughs> 200 years later. What, what does it mean? if uh, we have uh, published your documents so that every citizen can recite uh, official documents. Uh, my opinion is that it means also the, the best tool against corruption. If the administration is transparent, everyone can recite information as to what happened in uh, that sector or what is taxation bill of my neighbor. So, well, it's quite easy to like control or this transparent system makes it maybe quite impossible to get more productive instruments. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is architecture we are uh, together now building a house on solid grounds, on basic values, with four corners, and this picture will only show that you, you hire a house, you will build. That, that easier it is that, that the corners are swaying in the air, and it, it will be needed some interlocking structures, I mean between these corners, good relations, and I call it social capital. Actually, it, it can be called maybe better as trust in society. If there will be trust in society, so it's much easier to have good regulatory policy, trust to using public power and separation powers and government and also it will be easier to implement rights and duties of citizens. They 
are some researchers shown that <coughs> trust in, let's say, in South European countries, Greenland, Italy, etc., it, it's quite low nowadays, and that, that means that, that they are not voluntary basis to pay taxes either. If the, the trust in using public power is on high level, it's much, much easier to collect, of course, money and take care of healthcare and education and these kind of things. So that actually the trust, social capital, is the best capital in the country. I, I will finish saying some few words about how to monitor rule of law and development. That is not an easy task because you have so many indicators, indexes. I have found it in the internet 21 different global uh, monitoring systems. They are transformation index, corruption indexes, political terror scale, trade states index, doing business index, they are e e economic monitoring systems also, some, some more juridical systems. It's enormous information uh, collected in, in these monitoring systems. But if we will have some, let's say, whole picture, what would be rule of law development? We have to make this uh, in, in matrix and uh, see many different indicators and uh, have some conclusions of them. But that's, that's not enough to have global peace index that, uh, of course, shows something, but economic freedom is, could be an other thing. So that my message is that it, it's better always to have some more indicators and not see the things uh, as black and white and estimate carefully and analyze where the level of this I do have some two slides more. Very, very shortly saying as I'm a retired judge from admin the court, state state council considered that. So I would say that administrative justice, as I see it, is in key position guaranteeing rights and duties of the citizen because it is very often the question how is the relation between centralized public power and for citizens and that, that will be many active proceedings and they take care of justice and if it is a great the responsibility also on the court side to decide or justify. The next one, we do it some, maybe there may be no poverty, but these covers and so there is corruption in the country. Everywhere, <laughs> Every, everywhere. There are hardly any, any country without any corruption. Maybe there are some, some countries less corrupted, but corruption is one thing we have to fight against, and <coughs> we can have the last picture. Defining corruption is also a heavy task because we can find many definitions, but maybe this Transparency International defines corruption as the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. It's very flexible. 
but can confirm it whatsoever. But the most important in this last slide is that also the indicators which have been developed just to measure and monitor corruption problems, they are also quite complicated. This is the red light governance indicator and it has six sectors, accountability, political stability, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, and rule of law and control of corruption. Even here, I will end by saying that rule of law, actually, functioning rule of law is in key position also fighting against corruption. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to have this lecture at the Deep Diplomatic Club. I never have had audience like this and lovely palace, and the feeling is like of a diplomat. <laughs> Criminal crimes, but um, 
he is responsible for the political, let's say, uh, responsibility and political corruption. This is what the court say. Actually, in the early days of the revolution of 2011, we all decided, all the political parties, politicians, revolutionary forces, we thought, including the Muslim Brotherhood, we thought that the best is to avoid having exceptional courts or revolutionary courts. We thought we would like to have this revolution peacefully. Why revolution? So it's a message for the whole world that this is, you know, the new issue. And maybe it was an idea that we might manage to regain our assets, which was abroad, which if any left, still left, I mean. This was the idea at that time. Now, do you think that this choice was right? Because we feel some of us now feel a bit guilty that we should have had this revolutionary courts or exceptional courts. And our idea was that this is, we have to apply rule of law in the ordinary court, normal courts, not by having an exceptional court. So I, I need you just to say, was it right or it was wrong? Thank you. <laughs>
text of Mubarak's revolution, uh, constitution itself. It's quite a good one. The problem is the not the text, but the implementation. And that can be guaranteed only by one a strong public opinion that can safeguard it. Without that, there is no use for having any good text. Thank you. Yes, you un underline that law in the books, text in the Constitution could be rather a good plan, but then the implementation is in the key law, of course, obviously. How are we that that will be realized? Thank you. Constitution is, we can say that it's a high legislation we have, but at the same time it is a weak legislation because our Constitution 2014 is, is, is very nice, but it's not really in fact, we have maybe like thousands and thousands of legislations and those have to be revised, and this is one of the most, as, as much values and principles involved were included in the Constitution, in practicing, we still have to wait out. Another issue about one, I think one of our mistakes, or have Mr. Sadat have mentioned that there is a new or there is some legislation where amendment or uh, published by the president, and the new parliament have only 15 days to comment. Uh, Mr. Miguel Boy was having an article commenting about one of these legislations that how much it can deeply affect the Egyptian society. The last slide you were talking about corruption. The last decision about the court of, of Mubarak and his two sons, that how in a country after a revolution we can we say that after it's okay after like if ten years is passed, I cannot accuse or sending someone who was in the ex regime to the court, because according to the normal law, this corruption case, uh, I cannot, uh, because it's, it's, it's up, it's over. There's a time limit, it's over, that no one can accuse, uh, accuse someone. The last issue about, I think one of the most mistakes, and I hope that I hear from you, uh, not a diplomatic answer, but a, a judge uh, comment. I think one of our mistakes that the, the President Adli Mansour, who all is the President of the High Supreme Consti uh, Constitutional Law, uh, Court, sorry. he was a President, and for an example, the law of demonstration was like legislated in his time of power. All of the people now are saying, why do not we go to the High Court with this law? But on the other hand, he was a President, he approved it. From my point of view, that I, we will not go to the Constitutional Court and ask the, the director or the manager of the High Constitutional Court to make a decision to allow or to an legislation he already approved while he was a president. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a uh, very interesting lecture. Uh, my point of view actually is that uh, the questions that should be addressed to all Egyptians nowadays is that do we want to live in the past or the future? And this is a very essential you know, question uh, that uh, in case of it, uh, we can refer to parts of your lecture to uh, like uh, uh, referring to what uh, Mr. Sadat has mentioned, that uh, he is feeling, you know, very sorry because is it better that we have to use this revolutionary, uh, you know, I don't think this is relevant nowadays. From my point of view, we have to think about our future. What is going to build our future? How to, you know, build our parties properly? Uh, without neglecting that there was corruption and we need, you know, to enhance this situation. We have used some indicators uh, to prevent 
corruption and even if some of those who committed this corruption, uh, you know, uh, rules of law should be applicable. And here it comes how to put properly our indicators regarding transitional, you know, what we can call transitional uh, equality and equity. And, uh, you know, from here it comes how to start. So I believe that instead of just thinking about, uh, you know, the past and uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, uh, we, have, we are exerting our uh, efforts and time. And we don't have, even in Egypt now, the luxury to waste this time. Thank you. If, if 
wife has done wrong or right. So that I will keep my mind anyway so that this is not this house with four corners. It, it is not a new concept. It is more or less a method to measure and monitor rule of law development. And then <coughs> why, why I uh, like uh, uh, this kind of me metaphor? Uh, that is, in some Asian countries, it, it used to be so difficult to discuss about rule of law and legality and this. If you don't have any concrete picture how they are linked to each other, this has nothing to do with it, uh, what, what is a bad man or the bad man here. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> then we, we have to be a little bit idealist in, anyway, and we have to go forwards. I will uh, answer also in that question. Maybe. It has been some mistakes in the past, and they will be analyzed, of course, again and again. Expert will analyze the old cases and see if, if it was wrong or not. But anyway, the system must go forward. Uh, is somebody behind? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 I just had a comment. Regarding the point that was made earlier about living in the past and uh, that we shouldn't uh, fixate on a lot of trial or because it marks a previous uh, issue or atrocity that's uh, in the past and it's important to look forward. But isn't it of the utmost importance that we look at the Mulwana trial not as a, uh, an issue of the previous atrocities that took place in uh, January 25th, uh, 2011, but rather the fact that the verdict itself represents the very uh, issues with uh, lack of accountability and corruption that the revolution was started for. And so I think it's very important that we sort of address the verdict itself, not just over something of a past occurrence, but it representing the very issue we have with the courts, uh, the very issue we have with lack of accountability and corruption in Egypt. So I think it's impossible for us to move forward and to actually pursue a legal system that isn't hindered and marred by corruption, where the pursuit of justice is actually possible, in order to do that, we should learn from our mistakes and we should examine the past. And I don't think that the Mubarak trial, or the Mubarak in particular, uh, represents uh, an issue that has uh, exhausted its statute of limitations. Uh, no one was asking for politicized courts. No one was asking for revolutionary courts. Those have a habit of turning into witch trials, where the result doesn't reflect the actual uh, just uh, response for the, for the trial, but I think that it's to say that this is something in the past and that we should leave it in the past uh, is allowing this to happen again and again and again in the future. I, I, I can comment a little bit. Of course, what we leave in the past, we can find in the future. So that it's, it's, it's not so easy to like, uh, leave things in, in, in the past. I remember that uh, if we jump to another country in the UK, Great Britain, that there was the law until 1946, uh, which uh, stated that the king can do no wrong, but that is no more a law in Great Britain. It, it is very important that in all levels, presidential level, parliamentary level, and in all using of public power, the law will be strictly followed. Maybe this is a diplomatic answer also, but some substance in that answer also. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I would like to take it back to the next um, But again, on the same uh, under the same heading of the social capital, right? So I think I was stricken by the fact that you actually centered your intervention on the role of the parliament as implementing the constitution, right? Whereas we know that Finland is quite unique in actually its ability, in the ability of its parliament to actually amend its own constitution, 
right? So with such a prominent parliament in the institutional design, I wonder, again, going back to the issue of social capital, how the courts like the Supreme Court or the Supreme uh, Administrative, uh, Administrative Court actually relate to that. I mean, we know that compared to these Supreme Constitutional Court or Supreme Court have <coughs> hard time addressing decisions made by the legislature right after they have they are passed because the social capital of that decision is very high, right? In the Finnish Constitution or the Finnish uh, setting, that seems to be even more so the case because you know if that is the case, the the parliament itself can decide to overrule that and actually change the constitution. So I wonder if you can think of uh, institutional design mechanisms that you know were somehow built into the Finnish experience that we can benefit from from, a, from the perspective of constitution making and constitution drafting. Given that uh, the the drafting of the Finnish constitution is like the ideal, right? If you look at Elster, it's like you know a constitution should be made over time. We should you know mull over our decision. Whereas in a context like a revolution, all the requirements to the whole, right? So, I mean, keeping in mind that we don't have the luxury of actually building over our, you know, decisions and building the circle of capital for institutions, are there some um, elements from the Finnish experience that we can use in terms of institutional design, especially? I think that uh, it, it's hardly possible to export any institutions or uh, methods. I have only thought about our experiences, which is a very simple constitution, um, very old tradition to follow constitution and uh, legality. <coughs> and in, in our, if, if we are thinking about interpretation, of constitution we do have in the parliament constitutional committee which always goes through all the proposals if they have something to do with constitution so that the the, the, the papers and reports of that constitutional committee that they are some legal source also uh, or other agencies, courts and administration just to find out what was the meaning of that law and that, that is one of our instruments so that the preventive uh, check of constitutionality of ordinary proposals and this preventive control is then uh, followed by uh, primacy of constitution so that we in courts can in evident conflict set aside ordinary law so that these two things together makes uh, constitutional uh, value oriented uh, methods I would say but we, we do not have any models or methods to give to you actually I think that uh, you have to find your own solutions and uh, it, it's always uh, anyway important to have a comparative studies and to see what was happening in other countries. It, especially concerning human rights, they use the amount of information how these human rights have been implemented. I have a question related to the last two questions here. Uh, I'd like to ask about Finland, actually, and judicial traditions in Finland in terms of uh, uh, the right for the media to critique or comment on court rulings. Uh, I understand that in the US, for example, the Supreme Court uh, issues its own critique by the dissent uh, and majority or minority the minority will publish that we will not agree with that for the following reasons and there is no problem in the US traditions about people commenting in the media about Ferguson uh, verdict or others 
Uh, however, in, in Egypt, there is a legal debate. The minority of them, of uh, scholars, would support the rights of women on uh, judicial rulings and verdicts, while the majority are telling us that the ruling is the truth. And you cannot comment because you are undermining the integrity of the whole judicial system. So you could criticize the president, the speaker of the house, but not the judicial. I would like to know about the Scandinavian judicial tradition uh, and Finland in particular. Thank you. Our media is uh, quite active to criticize everybody, every instance, also president, government, parliament, and especially court decisions, if they find uh, something wrong in the decisions. So that, uh, on, on the other side, I would say that if the decisions of the court will be criticized, it, it, it is a question of professionalism on, on the court side, not like uh, take in account the critics in the public, because that, that, that is very important that we will not open the door for a trial by media. But uh, as you know, in our country it's allowed, of course, criticize also the president, government, that, that is uh, only possible. It, uh, only, of course, if we are taking in account the European Convention on uh, Human Rights, there will be some exceptions so that in not like make only harmful influence, it must be something reality in that. <coughs> So that I would say that the freedom of opinion and media and press is uh, very guaranteed in, in, in uh, North North countries. Um, I'm just uh, writing with, um, with, with a journalist a book about freedom of speech and information. It will be in international book and collected uh, some facts and uh, uh, material from different countries and it, it has been surprising how many violations actually there will be in different countries concerning freedom of speech and uh, media. Uh, even in, in those countries like UK and uh, US, uh, that's Western countries which always will predict uh, freedoms. Uh, ranking place of the U.S. is nowadays 46 in uh, ranking of uh, reporters with without any borders. Uh, 46 of 179 countries. And UK also going down. It, it depends uh, maybe on uh, Edward Snowden, uh, which uh, gave out some information and for security reasons. The, even these countries has uh, that, uh, more stress on media. What is the rank of the thing? Uh, but it's fair. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are. I would like to share an idea that I have about the, the relationship between exceptional laws and the rule of law. But when some, if not most people, when they speak about exceptional laws, um, they, they say that the mere fact of issuance of exceptional laws is a clear indication that there has been a deviation from the rule of law. I think this is not necessarily the case. I, I believe strongly that it is simply illogical to expect ordinary laws that have been issued under ordinary circumstances to function properly when we are facing exceptional circumstances. <coughs> so my idea is that exceptional laws can be, in certain cases, an indication that the rule of law is actually respected. And having said that, I think the key issue now becomes how are exceptional laws issued, and not just the fact that we have exceptional laws. 
and I would like to have your thoughts on this. Thank you. One final question before we give the final word to Dr. Helper. So that will be my last question. <laughs> I will uh, answer this question first. Uh, if, if, if you mean uh, some exceptional uh, laws in uh, situations of emergency or in ordinary exceptions, uh, situations of emergency situations, uh, we have in our constitution the uh, section that basic rights and liberties, such provisional exceptions to basic rights and liberties that are uh, compatible with Finland's international obligations concerning human rights and that are deemed necessary, <coughs> necessary in the case of an armed attack against Finland or in there exists an emergency that threatens the nation and which according to the act is so serious that it can be compared with an armed attack maybe provided by an act. So that it, it's very seldom we can make exceptions concerning our fundamental rights. That may, maybe that is too strict uh, if, if you are thinking about that, but uh, and th that is, anyway, our tradition. I, I will end my <coughs> boring lecture uh, just by saying that it has been a great honor to come to Egypt, Cairo, and uh, see many cultural places, and especially open-minded atmosphere, open-minded discussions We've had, uh, even today, with, with many representatives of high-ranking legislators, and also we discussed uh, with uh, Mr. Musa, uh, who gave us the picture that the new constitution is not for the past, it's for nowadays circumstances and for the future. Uh, I will repeat my, let's say, Sinute argument, so that uh, we Finns, we are very tiny people, nation, we will not have a role of any teacher or give uh, messages or so on, but we are very interested to have contacts, open-minded contacts, and that, that would be a great pleasure for me to uh, keep these contacts and uh, someday meet again and uh, we would discuss even more about rule of law and constitutional reforms. And welfare, justice, democracy, sustainable economy and welfare. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.